Junkyard Batman, Chapter One I was eleven, and even then I was starting to see the man I was growing into. I was a weed, my pants too short and my sneakers too tight. Though I hadn't grown any facial hair like I was desperate to, I still had the eyes of an adult. Through the mirror, I could see maturity there, harsh maturity. It was the first year anniversary of losing mom and dad. I was supposed to be asleep, but I snuck out of the master bedroom of the empty family trailer to spy on Uncle Lou and Al. At night they always shared a beer and chatted about the new junk in the yard, or even shared salacious stories of their youth. But tonight I heard nothing. No chatter, no jokes. It worried me. So I snuck out of bed and peeked through the yellowing plastic blinds to see them sitting in mismatched lawn chairs, an industrial spool between them serving as a table. After a few moments, Al broke the silence. Cheryl got away with it then. That what you're saying? Uncle Lou took a long swig from his beer. He preferred fancier stuff, beer from Europe, whereas Al drank the cheapest thing he could find. But Uncle Lou didn't answer. He just stared out into the yard, surveying our wane junk's trove of piled cars, gutted refrigerators, bent bed frames, and old computers. Our junkyard kingdom spans 18 acres at the south end of Gotham, on the outskirts. And one year ago, our kingdom had lost our king and queen. And there I was, the scrawny prince, unable to sleep in the massive bed his parents left cold. Taking a final aggressive swig of his beer, Uncle Lou politely suppressed a burp and said, Yes and no. He's detained, but because of the meth he was on and whatnot, he won't get life. And he got moved to a facility for addiction, not prison. I could hear the sorrow in Uncle Lou's voice. His sister, my mother, had been dear to him. When he had heard the news, he left his teaching job in England and moved out here to look after me. He wanted to buy a home, but since the junkyard was the only means of income, he stayed here. Besides, the Waynes could never sell Wayne junk. Al's lived here through three owners prior. It would have been wrong to make Al suffer a fourth. That good enough for you? Al asked pointedly. Folding his hands, Uncle Lou stared into his lap. You know it isn't, but he's off the street, and Bruce is my priority. Our priority, Al interjected. Watched him grow. Want to see that done right? He finished the cheap beer and crushed the can in his hand. Hate that they blamed the drugs Chill was on, and not the mind that steered them into his veins. He reached for another beer. I was almost eleven, damn it. I should be a part of this conversation. Banging through the screen door, I stomped down the wooden steps. Barefoot, I stood in the gravel and faced them. Al snickered as Uncle Lou stood to usher me back inside. School tomorrow, Bruce. Your last day of in-school suspension. You've got to stay awake. I've got to do something, I said, holding my ground. I likely appeared absurd in my race car pajamas that barely fit. I've got to stop drugs, stop murder, stop the hurt. My eyes were blurring now. Yet again, I was going to cry, as always. And as usual, Uncle Lou reached to hold me. I shrugged him away. I need to do something, I shouted. You did so much already, Bruce, Uncle Lou consoled me. You took the witness stand, pointed him out. You did everything that could be asked. But what about what isn't asked? I snapped. What about justice? Real justice? You're far too hot-headed for doling out justice, Bruce. I mean, this is your third suspension for fighting in the school year. And you had always been a fighter, even before all of this happened. That isn't the temperament for... It's not fair, I yelled. This re recent suspension wasn't even my fault. He was a bully, and he was pushing around a smaller kid. A broken nose was warranted. Through my eyes, my blurry eyes, I spied the grin on Al's face. Boy's always been a scrapper, 
he tipped his new beer can toward me and drank a toast in my honor. I'll please, Uncle Lou admonished. Turning back to me, he continued. A fighter is fine in the ring, but he needs control, discipline, and most of all, compassion. A compassionate fighter makes the hard choice of when not to swing his fist. Have you shown that wisdom? Hmm? His eyebrows raised high into his forehead, just like Mom's did. But I was dead set. Uncle Lucius, I'm going to make the world better, my way, and I want you there to help. Both of you. I need you. But this is happening. I'm going to find the people who hurt others. I'm going to find the drugs and burn them, the bullies and beat them, and the murderers and catch them. With a defeated sigh, Uncle Lou straightened. Then be a police officer, Bruce. Al sneered. In this town, a cop? He's half black, so they'll give him shit and keep him at the bottom forever. His bright blue eyes burning with sudden anger. Trust the same people that let Chill stay in a comfy hospital for what he done? Alfred! Uncle Lou roared. But Al darted to his feet. For an old geezer, he was still spry when Fury took him. Nose to nose, he snarled at Lou. This ain't England! You notice people treating you different for being dark yet? Hey, Lou? Only the reason the Wayne double homicide made the news was because one was a white man. That stung Uncle Lou. The realization that a black woman being shot at the concession stand of a drive-in theater only mattered if the man dying next to her was white. I saw his hurt, so I reached out and held Uncle Lou's hand. Both men simmered down, suddenly aware that their own grief had interrupted mine. I mean it. I felt my throat closing. I struggled to speak, pushing through the threatening sobs. I'm going to fight. I'm going to make a difference. And you both will help me. And I remember that vividly. Because here I am, ten years later, gearing up for the first night of many. Al helped me fix up an arm and armor an old tow truck from the 50s. And Uncle Lou helped me choose a target an isolated field of meth-producing trailers two hours south of Gotham. It's run by a crazy guy calling himself Joker. I'll strike in the middle of the night with bombs we rigged from propane tanks and set the whole place ablaze. Slipping on my armor, Uncle Lou reviews my strategy with me. He saves the most important bit for last. Nobody dies. Make sure of it. Nobody dies. I nod committed to the promise. It's already dark as I roll out of the yard. The reinforced windows in the tow truck can't roll down, so I flicker the headlights in departure. I know Al and Uncle Lou are both worried, even if they show it differently. Al was cracking crude jokes while helping me dress, and Uncle Lou was triple-checking everything with quivering hands. Both good men fathers to me. I'm pretty sure neither of them wanted me to do this, but I was hell-bent, so they made sure that I at least was doing it right. Saddled into the driver's seat of my truck, I realize how uncomfortable the padding of this armor really is. I can take a bullet to the chest or back, but my arms and legs are vulnerable. Al had built it from his old army gear and some riot stuff from the pawn shop. We painted it all black, and of course, there is the helmet. For the helmet, we took an old hockey helmet and trimmed it a bit. Then I fixed the flipping welding shield to the front of it. The pointed ears at the top was my personal touch. I wanted to look like a bat. I know, it sounds absurd, but hear me out. I used to be scared of the dark as a kid. One night, Mom was tucking me in, trying to get me to sleep with the light off like a big boy, and she told me everyone is afraid of the dark. I protested, claiming that bats aren't. They love the dark. She laughed. Mom's hearty, lovely laugh. After that day, I always liked bats. They did two things that impressed me. They traveled in the dark without fear, and they made my mom laugh. So Batman it is. Batman, I am. In my bat truck? Batmobile? I'll, I'll work on the name. I tuck in for a long haul. Once clear of Gotham's south end, civilization drops off pretty quickly. The suburbs are to the north of the city, 
where families and people live with better jobs. To the south, down here, it just bleeds from industrial zone to open flat road. Occasionally, you'll see a trailer home here or a vacant gas station there. But overall, this part of the state is a lot of nothing. Which turned out to be a perfect place for this Joker guy to set up a meth complex. Once COVID closed the border with Mexico, hauling meth in became too difficult to be profitable, so its rate of import dropped off. Smaller, independent outfits like Jokers popped up all throughout the Midwest. They cook it in vats like witches' cauldrons, bake it, powder it up, and put it into little capsules. Apparently, Joker has his own recipe that gets people giggly. The local Gotham News had a number of crazies laughing as they charged cops or jumped off of buildings expecting to fly. To learn more, I went into the city some nights to buy bags of it. Lucius wanted samples to tinker with in the lab, see if he could figure where it was coming from. While shopping for meth, I pulled several sellers into simple conversation. I can be nice. Disarming, despite my size. Some guys told me it comes from the South. I even asked one, do you feel bad selling people this stuff? He told me that it was on me that I was doing it, not him. It was my option to do it. So here I am, in the Batmobile, driving south to take that option off the table for people. But I'm not going unprepared. We scouted the whole area first. I got a used drone off of eBay, with what leftover money my parents had saved for my eventual college. It flew well, and we went out at night. There was a whole lot of nothing, but soon we saw a trailer park, shaped in a circle like wagons defending from an Indian attack. Most of their roofs were gone, and inside they were lit with black light cooking and baking away. Joker is so bold. Anyone flying over in a small plane would see his operation. After several weeks of scouting, we came to the conclusion that the meth compound cleared out at night. Everyone piled into their cars and drove off in separate directions. Which is good, because I'm not going there to fight. I'm just going there to shut it down, buy people on the streets some time. The plan is simple, yet dramatic. I've got eight propane tanks rattling in a sluice on the back of the truck. As I drive around the compound, I'll hit a toggle I wired into the dash and drop them one at a time by the trailers. The timers on them will have to be manually set prior, which is easy, but still once I drop them, there is no going back. Homemade explosives are fairly easy to make. I soaked it in several tubs I dragged out of the yard, but the wiring took some time. Each tank has a cheap digital watch, none of them matching since I got them out from under car seats and inside dashboards, forgotten items from junked cars. Eight rattling bombs of propane. The route I planned kept me away from street lights and highways. I don't think a highway patrolman would think well of walking up to my tow truck. Black propane tanks stacked in the back like depth charges asking for my registration. I kind of wish I had kept the radio in the truck, though. This is a boring ride. Maybe I should install a police scanner if I can, for future operations. But the dark, lonely ride there gives me plenty of time to rethink this, to talk myself out of it. Am I really doing this? Am I really going to blow apart a massive meth lab, make a lot of bad people angry? Hell yes I am. Mom wouldn't like it, and Dad probably wouldn't either, but they were smart and kept their heads down out of trouble. But that certainly didn't spare them now, did it? I hope they'd at least understand why I'm doing it. When I hit 20, I realized that this and all my plans weren't for them. It was unfair to shove any responsibility for my actions or desires on the two people who had departed this earth, two gentle people. No, this is for me. I relish tomorrow's news. Whatever anchor gets there first to report on the smoldering crater of Meth Central. Justice was done tonight, they'll say. Kids and families are a bit safer. I'm here. At least, my map says I am. I didn't use a phone or any kind of GPS because I don't want my location tracked via tower but I'm pretty sure I'm two miles north of the compound. There's a ridge keeping me out of sight, and I toggled the truck's headlamps to the red bulbs a few miles out, 
just in case anyone was late in leaving, I didn't want them to see me coming. The clock in the dash reads 2.30 a.m. Every time I scouted with the drone, they were gone by now. This is good. Swinging the armored door open, I slide out of the driver's seat. With a groaning stretch. My joints pop as I arrange my armor. I should figure out a way to slip it on after driving on the road next time, because my back is soaked with sweat. That's my punishment for picking a Mack tow truck from the 1950s to refurbish into the Batmobile. No air conditioning. I take stock of the propane bombs. One has a Hello Kitty watch. It's my favorite, so I activate the timer on it first. They each chirp awake from my touch. Running down the line, I set each tank for 12 minutes. There's no going back now. Well, actually, I could just pull the red wire clear of the plastique to kill the detonator, but I'm committed. Let's do this. Climbing back into the Batmobile, I slide my helmet on. Pulling the welding shield down, my ears nearly touch the ceiling of the cab. I do this in case there are cameras, but I also do this because I want to. I went through all this trouble to make this cool helmet after all. But I can still see and drive well enough. Pressing the gas, I slowly rumble down the road and into the dirt runoff. Rolling along with the headlights off, I enter the ring of trailers. Generators rumble next to each one with spare barrels of fuel nearby. I see no cars and no people. This is good. Things are going well. Flipping the toggle, I drop the first bomb. It rolls away slowly, disappearing in the red of my taillights as I proceed to drop more bombs. I've got five on the ground and eight minutes on the clock. But when I go to drop the sixth, I see a long shadow move. I hit the brakes. Desperately hoping it is a raccoon or a cat, I frantically scan through the passenger side window, trying to find a source. And I do. God help me, I do. The trailer with a roof is more than what it seems from the air. The drone couldn't see that it was a cover for a stairwell leading underground out of sight. But I sure can. And the guy who came up for a smoke break can see me. I stare at him through my mask. He's clearly unnerved, cigarette dangling from his lip as its dim light reflects off the trash bags he is wearing. A poor man's hazmat gear, taped together. He shouts something down the stairs. I'm now achieving new levels of sweat unbeknownst to mankind. My heart is fluttering as a cold river runs down my back. How many people are down there? Will my bombs cause a cave-in, killing dozens? What do I do? The clock is literally ticking. Two more trash big men climb up the stairs. They all point at the Batmobile and the idiot inside it, me. Then a fourth guy comes up. I know exactly who he is when I see him. He's shirtless with obnoxious tattoos on every inch of his starved, sinewy body. His hair is lying green and across his mouth is a tattooed red pair of lips like a clown. Pushing through his boys, his wiry body stalks toward me with an orange and yellow Nerf gun dangling from his hand. He smiles, and his teeth are gold, flashing like bloody copper in my red running lights. I have to tell him. I have to tell him or everyone will die. These bombs are going to go off. Nobody dies. Uncle Lou had demanded, and I promised. I can't roll the windows down and shout to him because they are bulletproof plexiglass. I have no speaker or bullhorn either. So much for being prepared. I set the truck in neutral. I can't believe I'm getting out, but I am. Walking around the Batmobile, I run my hand along the front as if touching it will bring me some sort of protection. I decide to be assertive. With a gloved hand, I point hard at Joker and stomp forward to meet him. You! I yell as loud as I can, the mask muffling me. Joker! He giggles at his moniker. As I get closer, I see that even his eyeballs are tattooed red. Who does that? Hey, boy! What the fuck are you? He's legitimately amused to see me. I don't scare him in the least. Bombs! I yell. I drop bombs! I point to the three remaining in my truck. We have to disarm them fast! Here! I spin around and grip the nearest one on the truck. Rotating it, I tug the red wire free, and it goes dead. Looking back at him, I realize he wasn't paying attention. He just keeps eyeing me up and down like a snack. It's creepy. Hey! 
I yell again. Jackass, look, the red wire here. See? See? I'm talking to him like the buffoon he is. This is making me furious that I have to save this asshole's life now. Turning to show him yet again how to disarm them, something hits me in the back of the head. Hard. My bell is ringing, and I stumble against the truck. It takes a moment to process, but he shot me. He shot me right in the back of the head. The helmet took it, but still. I spin around, not sure what to do, and he shoots me again right in the faceplate. That's not a Nerf gun, but a real gun painted to look like one. He's all smiles as his three boys run back down below. Enraged, I hoist a disarm bomb from my truck and hurl it at him. The thing is heavy, but I've been lifting weights my entire life. It arcs in the air and cracks into his knee. Joker winces, clutching his leg, and accidentally fires off around into the dirt. I bull rush him, all of me and all of him. It's like tackling a string bean and we tumble into the ground. Hammering his face twice with my face plate, the pistol loosens from his grip. I drive my knee into his midsection, right into his pelvis, repeatedly. I finally feel something crack like a twig in a bag of wet leaves. He's howling in pain, but huffing in joy at the same time. What the hell? Stop! Stop! A woman screams. Running from the stairwell comes this pregnant, barefoot young thing with white makeup on and pigtails. She's got two giant red tattooed dots on her face. One on each cheek like a doll. The three trash bag boys are following her, sporting firearms. It's a meth carnival. I'm in the meth circus, and yet I somehow feel like the clown. I'm the thing everyone is pointing and laughing at. The pregnant woman shoves me away from Joker with surprising strength. Jay, Jay, she sobs, cradling his head. My God, he's the dad. I'm standing there like a monolith over this twisted little family. Is this how Chill felt when he stood over Mom and Dad? as he destroyed my family. Oh, the bombs. I spin around, taking stock of where I dropped each one. Then I run back to my truck and unplug the last two that were armed. Kill this motherfucker! The woman snarls from behind me. They open fire. Diving into the back of the tow truck, it tinks with bullets as they land. I know one had a sold-off shotgun, so I wait for both those shots to be spent before rolling out the far side. As I do so, something ethereal punches me in the back of my left shoulder. I'm pretty sure the army took it all. Hitting the dirt, I scramble to the front of my truck and open the driver's side door and climb in. And one of the trash bag boys decided to do the same through the passenger side door. So now I'm sitting in next to one of these guys, and as he levels his tricked out machine pistol at me, I shift the truck in reverse and floor it. I could have gone forward, but reverse has more torque and just seemed like it would jerk him around more. And oh boy, it does. He slides out of the seat, machine pistol unloading its magazine in a single violent burp. Hot lead bounces everywhere, trapped by the bulletproof windshield as it ricochets around the cabin. Okay, I'm deaf now. I'll make a terrible bat. As we're peeling backward, we smash into one of the vacant trailers and it just folds in half under the power of the Batmobile's engine. At least I did something right when I built this thing. I grab my intruder, but still I'm pressing the gas in reverse as I hammer his head into the wood dash repeatedly. The glove box pops open as if offering to help. Let me eat him, the Batmobile says. <laughs> Unable to reload his gun quick enough, Trash Bag Boy realizes he's trapped in the cab of a rolling tank with a very pissed off dude weighing over 240 pounds. He's now begging for his life, truly terrified. Get out and run, I roar, shoving him out the other side. Reaching over, I slam the door shut behind him and lock it, like I should have in the first place. Bullets are nicking against the front and windshield from the other two baggers and the crazy pregnant woman. She's got the Nerf pistol in both hands, drilling away at me. The clock says four minutes until the first bomb goes off. Right now, I'm well far enough away, but the clowns and the trash bags are still within the circle of trailers in the kill zone. I could drive to each bomb, use the truck to block their fire and yank the red wires, but that means getting in and out repeatedly, which I don't like. And I'm starting to realize something is wrong with my shoulder. It hurts, and my left hand is starting to quiver. So I do the only other thing I could think of. I'm going to chase these guys off. Blaring the horn, I shift into gear and roar forward. The Batmobile's engine can be heard for miles and it charges. The bag boys get the picture immediately. They bolt 
but for the stairs. So I head them off. Gunning it, I get to the stairs before they do, and with the speed I'm going, I plow into the facsimile trailer, crashing right through it and jumping over the stairwell. The whole thing comes down behind me, blocking their retreat. They are in the open now, with me. Nowhere to go but run. Shifting into reverse, I tear the truck around. Hitting the lights, I have them locked into my beams like deer. The pregnant one screeches for the two minions to carry her baby daddy as I rev the engine. She's smart enough to know climbing into one of the trailers is a waste of time after how the Batmobile just ate two. So she does the next best thing. She runs. Backwards, no less, with her pistol trained on me, pregnant. Her boys are hauling the limp noodle of their leader. I flash the lights at her, driving the message home. Scram! Lurking forward, I give equal chase to their flight, keeping them in my headlights as we clear the trailer circle. She knows she is at my mercy. Mercy. Just as I ponder the word, the first bomb goes off behind me. Rapidly followed by four others, Looking through the back window, the entire trailer park detonates in a smoky haze of ash and severed electrical cables. Debris rains down on the hood, and the trash bag boys stare in surprise. But not the expecting mother. She knew what was what. We glare at each other, me in the driver's seat, and her in my headlights. This ain't over, although Joker's meth production sure is. I wish for a calling card, a final gesture of supremacy. Should I peek my head out and tell her I'm the Batman? No. My shoulder hurts too much. I've got a two-hour drive ahead of me, and the adrenaline will wear off before then. I'll have to struggle to stay awake. I shift into reverse and drive around the burning crater into the dirt road, leading away. Kinda wish I had the radio working.